the original Porsche Panamera had a somewhat rocky birth into this world. No one could deny its great performance, comfort and luxury, but its looks left a lot of people cold, if I could put it mildly. But now there's a brand new generation of Panamera, and I'm here in stunning South Africa to drive one in particular, the Panamera 4 e-hybrid. Now for this new Panamera, Porsche hasn't just given it a nip and a tuck, a facelift and a, a little bit of an update. No, they've thrown away the entire old car and started again from scratch. This car is built on a whole new platform. The same platform is going to be shared by all of the Panamera types and will in fact be shipped out to some other manufacturers for use. In particular, we heard Bentley. Now apparently they needed a whole new platform to be able to fit in all the different variants of the Panamera, but you have to think the e-hybrid would have been the most challenging with the battery pack and the electric motor to squeeze in there somehow. The engine isn't diminutive either, 2.9 litre V6, which unlike the previous e-hybrid is no longer supercharged, but fitted with a bi-turbo. Now the end result of those two motors working together is 462 brake horsepower and over 500 foot-pounds of torque. Zero to 60 is 4.4 seconds, which considering this car weighs about 2.1 tons, that's about 4,600 pounds. That is damn impressive. Now Porsche say for this car, they've brought in an all new improved PDK gearbox. Think about that for a minute. For a lot of people, the PDK was the single best dual clutch gearbox available out there on the market, and Porsche say they've now improved on it. With the PDK having been so good in the first place, it's hard to actually be able to tell just how much better this is, but as a PDK, it's amazing. Now, there's a very clever electromechanically actuated clutch that switches power from the internal combustion engine to the electric motor and back so seamlessly that you never notice it out on the road. There are quite a few different hybrid driving modes to choose from. The standard hybrid mode where the best compromise between the two engines is always picked to make sure you're getting the most efficient drive. But there's also a hybrid mode designed to store the battery power where it is, to keep it in reserve for when you really need it later on. And a third that allows you specifically to focus on charging the battery. In that one, the engine works a little bit harder than it needs to for normal driving, so it's always charging the battery in the background. Although this car is a full plug-in hybrid, you could charge it from absolutely empty to full in about five and a half hours from a standard wall outlet, and that could give you 50 kilometers of driving, which would satisfy most people's daily commute. Now, official fuel consumption figures for the US are yet to be published, but the UK figure stands at 112 miles per gallon, which translates to 95 miles per gallon in the US. That is stunning. Also, CO2 emissions are only 56 grams per kilometer, which is absolutely staggering. The quoted MPG is of course a best case scenario. After all the driving we did, we saw nowhere near that. Although my heavy right foot and the stop start nature of filming were almost certainly to blame for that. Drive this thing sensibly and you'll see much better mileage than an internal combustion engine only car of this size and power. I have been a Porsche Panamera fanboy since the first car came out. Around the office has been a running joke for years how much I've loved the Panamera. And that wasn't despite its looks. I liked the way it looked. But now with this redesign, they've really made it look part of the Porsche family. And Porsche tell me that that is exactly what they intended to do. It fits in right there with the 911 line. And really, if you're looking for practicality in a car, the Panamera really, really looks like a 911 for a man with a big family. For me though, the Panamera really is a GT car, a car designed to drive extremely long distances in supreme comfort, and this car delivers that in spades. Not just for the driver, but all of the back seats are fully laid out in the same leather as the front and an amazing rear entertainment system. It comes with two detachable 10.1 inch tablets in the rear, which run a Porsche skinned version of Android. It has all the apps you might want to put on an Android tablet. It can also view the speedometer and the G meter and control the climate control and view the map for the navigation. It's far more integrated as an idea that this is a driver's car, even if you're sitting in the back seat. And this certainly would put that question, are we there yet, to bed. The interior of the Panamera, for me, is where this car shines over its predecessor even more than on the exterior. The entertainment system in this car is now the most advanced in any Porsche available on the market today. 
We saw in the 991.2 Porsche 911 a big step up with Porsche dumping their old PCM system and going for a new one that integrated Apple CarPlay and stuff like that. This one goes that step further by giving us this absolutely gorgeous 12 inch display right here in the dash. The interface is beautifully rendered and responsive and although I found the menu system a little bit difficult to navigate with some duplication of options, it was a really, really nice experience of having it in the car. This center area here as well with these new touchscreen buttons looks very, very contemporary. One thing I'm really glad to see returning on this generation of Panamera is the option for a Burmester sound system. Now, if you're not familiar with Burmester, they make some of the top end home entertainment systems. If you wanted a home AV setup from them, you would probably have to put away a couple of hundred thousand euros. Considering that, putting a Burmester sound system in a Porsche Panamera is one of the cheapest ways of getting access to it. Burmester also developed the stereo for the Veyron, but they were never entirely happy with it. If you ask them what the best stereo system was they ever made, it was for this car. It's an amazing car stereo, the best I've ever heard in any car, and it returns in this one. Really, it's that marriage between performance and comfort and luxury that puts this in a different wheelhouse to almost anything else Porsche do. It has the practicality of something like a Cayenne, but without that huge body that prevents it from being really sporty. And when you put your foot down, all that performance is right there. Porsche has spent the last few years with cars like the 919 and the 918 developing a hybrid drivetrain system that's incredibly sophisticated for utmost performance. But that learning is beginning to trickle down now into road cars like this. And by seeing what Porsche is doing now, it can put your mind at ease. There is some real performance and driving fun to be had in these combination hybrid drivetrains where it's not just about efficiency, but cooperation, collaboration, and synergy to create more than the sum of their parts. So that new harmonious cooperation between the electric motor and the internal combustion engine translates into what is usually an incredibly sharp throttle. Although sometimes I find that going from about 30 miles an hour, the gearbox gets a little bit confused and might be fighting that engine management system somehow. If you take control of the gearbox yourself, you can get the most out of it though. The car is incredibly heavy, but never really feels it out on the road. The steering is weighted and precise and not at all numb. Let's for argument's sake, just see how this thing is off the line in Sport Plus mode. Oh yeah. <laughs> that 60, just like that. Now 4.4 seconds might not be the most ridiculously quick car you can get on the market, my word, that torque pushing a car this heavy that quickly feels phenomenal. All this hybrid power and tech-lined interior starts at around $95,000 but can go way north of that with options, which cost-wise puts this in the same ballpark as the higher-end Tesla Model S. As a plug-in hybrid though, the Panamera will appeal to those who have a desire to drive somewhat environmentally conscientiously, but for whom the idea of going fully electric just doesn't work. The e-hybrid has more power than entry-level Panameras, but will fall short of the top-of-the-line Panamera Turbo. The hybrid drivetrain also makes this slightly less dynamic to drive, even if that electric engine does make pulling away at lights a thrill. If you have decided that you are in the market for one of the Panamera models, then you'd have to be fully committed to the idea of hybrid driving to want to pick this over an alternative version. The second generation Porsche Panamera has addressed a lot of the issues that people had with the first one and added so much more on top. This new exterior styling plus great in-car tech added to a couple of years worth of great innovation in hybrid technology make this an incredible package out on the road. Now the e-hybrid might not necessarily be my favorite Panamera, but this just might be my favorite hybrid. You know what the best thing is about being 6,000 miles away from home? Being 6,000 miles away from Alex. Oh, 